I would like to invite up to our podium John Huffman, the Reverend John Huffman, who has uh, been a vital part of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary for years and years, and who graciously takes of his time to come to be with us as pastor in residence. So Dr. Huffman, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Isaacs. Great to be with you. It's great to be with you again. And I was just thinking, um, uh, sitting here, this is the end of uh, six years of uh, being your uh, pastor in residence and coming uh, for a week each autumn and a week each spring. So those of you that have been around here a long time, hopefully none of you have been here that many years unless you're <laughs> faculty or staff. Um, but um, I figured out if I've spoken uh, by the time I'm done today and tomorrow 23 times, uh, which is uh, a lot of uh, talking in front of you. And uh, I'm going a very different direction tomorrow. And I hope you'll get the word out. Um, I know we're fascinated by Pope Francis. Very interesting person. And also uh, fascinated by the dynamics between evangelical Christians and Roman Catholic believe believers. I have a contention that uh, within Protestantism, we have a lot of nominal followers of Jesus. And within Catholicism, uh, you have the same Roman Catholicism. But we have much in common with those who really love the Lord without minimizing the distinctions doctrinally. They're there uh, between those of us who love Jesus, that wear the label Protestant, and those that wear the label Catholic. And I want to talk a little bit about that and uh, also to share personally, a year ago uh, this month, I was invited uh, to be a member of the International uh, Colloquium on uh, interfaith conversations about the family. And so I was at the Vatican, uh, as close to the Pope as I am to you. He gave the opening address, and uh, there were representatives from all the major world religions, and uh, 35 countries present, about 235 of us, uh, plus about 20 cardinals seated in the room where the conclave is held to decide who the new Pope will be prior to going to the Sistine Chapel to vote. And it was quite an experience uh, to observe him and then uh, to be invited to be part of his entourage uh, in September, visiting uh, with him uh, the entourage, not him personally, but being with his group in Washington, D.C. for the canonization of uh, Father Sarah and other activities, then go up to New York uh, for the evening worship at St. Patrick's Cathedral to be at the United Nations the next morning and to hear his address and then go down to Philadelphia where his final stop was and to be close up to him. I want to make some observations about him personally and the dynamics uh, facing him and I think it will be helpful to you and to all of us in our ministries in the future. That's tomorrow. Today um, I'm going to put the calendar back a week. And I want to contend that there's a tendency for us to concentrate on Thanksgiving once a year and miss the opportunity of gratitude that defies the church liturgical year because perhaps I should be speaking on an Advent theme. But instead, I have been fascinated by two articles which I read in the last two weeks that have triggered my thoughts in this area and a theme that I perennially like to come back to, that of Thanksgiving. One is an article in the Christian Century uh, dated uh, November 11 by Martin Copenhaver, who for many years was a pastor in Wellesley and more recently is the dean of the Andover Newton Divinity School, uh, which uh, he may have a difficult time having some things to be thankful for right now because they have their problems. But the topic of his article is learning to give thanks. And in this, he makes these observations. He talks about the importance of an attitude of gratitude. And he said, let me put it another way. Who is tempted to claim that he is a self-made man or she is a self-made woman? 
Is it the person who has few of the world's goods uh, and has known little of earthly success, or the person who's been given much and owes much? He said, I once heard of a man who consistently boasted that he was a self-made man until an exasperated friend finally declared, well, sir, that relieves the Lord of a terrific responsibility. <laughs> and he goes on to write, such an attitude also deprives the Lord of thanks. True thanksgiving begins with humility. The humility to recognize that we did not create ourselves, that everything we are and everything we have is a gift. And then he quotes um, the great theologian um, um, television series, uh, The Simpsons. And he says that when Bart is asked to offer thanks at a family meal, he says, quote, Dear God, we bought all this stuff with our own money, so thanks for nothing. End of quote. Juxtaposing the dynamics of the self-made person, the person who thinks, well, I have a right to all this stuff. After all, didn't I earn it the hard way? and a spirit of gratitude, and the fact that often it's those of us that have the most for which to be grateful that are the least grateful. We develop a sense of entitlement. Now, juxtaposed with this was an article I stumbled into in the New York Times a week ago Sunday, uh, written by a chap by the name of Arthur C. Brooks, who's the president of the American Enterprise Institute and also a contributing opinion column writer for the New York Times. He starts out by describing his wedding 24, 25 years ago in Barcelona, Spain, and explaining to his in-laws what Thanksgiving was because they were there at the time of Thanksgiving. First of all, they had a far, hard time finding a turkey. And the turkey came, it wasn't even plucked fully. They had to finish plucking the thing. And the bird was too big to fit into their little oven. And then the idea of cranberries, his in-laws had never heard of cranberries, and um, wondered how in the world you could find a fowl that had so much bread inside it. <laughs> uh, they had not heard of stuffing, and he had to explain all that. And then uh, his father-in-law said, but, but what he did, nothing to be thankful for. I mean, the whole idea of setting aside a day to be thankful was quite foreign to them, which triggered his thoughts, and he uh, wrote uh, an essay, of which I'll quote a few things here. He, he, he described me, he, he titles it, Choose to be Grateful. It will make you happier. And he says, The evidence suggests that we can actively choose to practice gratitude and that doing so raises your happiness. This is not just self-improvement hokum. For example, researchers in one 2003 study randomly assigned one group of study participants to keep a short weekly list of things they were grateful for, while the other group listed hassles or neutral events. Ten weeks later, the first group enjoyed significantly greater life satisfaction than the other. Other studies have shown the same pattern and lead to the same conclusions. If you want a truly happy holiday, choose to keep the thanks in Thanksgiving, whether you feel like it or not. And how does this all work? One exclamation is it coaxes one's brain into processing positive emotions. In one famous 1993 experiment, researchers asked human subjects to smile forcibly for 20 seconds while tensing facial muscles, notably the muscles around the eyes called the orbicularis oculi, which create crow's feet. They found that this action stimulated brain activity associated with positive emotions. Just forcing yourself to smile uh, can produce some good things. And if a grinning for an uncomfortably long time, uh, like a scary lunatic isn't your cup of tea, try expressing gratitude instead. According to research published in the Journal of Cerebral Cortex, gratitude stimulates the hypothalamus, a key part of the brain that regulates stress, and the ventral 
integumental area, part of our reward circuitry that produces a sensation of pleasure. And he goes on and gives all kinds of studies, and I'm here to preach the gospel, not to quote uh, Christian Century and uh, the New York Times, but I thought it's fascinating that such publications emphasize at, of course, the appropriate time of year, Thanksgiving, the importance of gratitude. But I'd like to direct our thoughts this morning to the Word of God in Philippians chapter 4. We open the Bibles, and do me a favor, keep the Bible open. When I'm finished reading the passage, I hate that, that resounding sound that goes all through the sanctuary. If you can get the people to open the Bible for the Scripture reading, and then when it's done, you hear all the Bibles closing just like that. Keep it. If I see anyone close your Bible, I'm going to call you out on it and report you. Okay, I don't know who I'm going to report you to, but anyway, I'm going to report you. All right. Now, I'm reading from the um, NIV, and I think you have, what, the new NIV there? Um, and I'm not sure. There may be slight uh, word differences on this. And I'm just going to read very briefly uh, verses 4 uh, through 7. Uh, Philippians 4, verses uh, 4 through 7. Let's do what they do in the Scots tradition. Many of the Scots, let's stand, if you're able, and honor the word of God. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say it, what? Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be what? Anxious. Anxious about anything. Hmm. But in everything, by prayer and petition, supplication, King James says, with what? Thanksgiving. Present your request to God and what? The peace of God that uh, our professor prayed about a few minutes ago. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And keep it open as you now are seated. If you close it, you have to stand all the way through the message, all right? <laughs> this, to me, is a text I return to many times. Two years ago, I shared some of the thoughts out of this passage. But I'd like to come at it in a way that hopefully generates not because it's Thanksgiving. That was last week. That one day is over. And by the end of the day... Hopefully you were so stuffed that you got a good night of sleep and so forth, but then you're kicking yourself the next morning for eating so much if you were blessed to be in an environment with family and friends where you had food. And I realize some of you are away from family, and perhaps it was a lonely time for you. Hopefully there are others that took you in and made you feel good. But it says here, instead of anxiety, I believe we live in an era of anxiety. My wife is a psychoanalyst. Uh, She's amazed at how many people just seek her out and seek her out to deal with long-term anxiety. And uh, that's a reality. And now, I realize there can be clinical dimensions to this, and that's one of the problems I have with the kind of comments that I read at the beginning. Some of this can be somewhat superficial because it basically says if you think right, everything's going to turn out right, and that's not the way life works, is it? because we know there are some issues in our lives that we have to face that are tough issues. But Paul writes to us saying um, that instead of anxiety, uh, it's possible for you uh, and me to live lives that are marked by two wonderful qualities here. And one is the quality of joy. And that's a quality you just can't manufacture for yourself. That's different from happiness, isn't it? It's different from a pleasurable feeling you get from smiling into the mirror for uh, 20 seconds, relaxing and smiling again, and uh, even though that may produce a good feeling. Uh, this is a joy, a wholeness, uh, a fullness, one of uh, the wonderful fruits of, of the Spirit. But we see also, and, and we realize that the Apostle Paul is not a prosperity gospel preacher. I mean, we could read at length the number of times he was shipwrecked, the number of times he was in prison, the number of times he was beaten, the number of times they 
tortured him by throwing stones at him, a first century way of dealing with that, which was the ultimate in, uh, 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 of disgrace, is to be stoned. And, um, and, and he, he talked about uh, having some very good time, abundant times in life, and learning how to be a base. I'd say he'd fit in fairly well here at Gordon Conwell, although I don't think any of us have experienced the extremes of difficulty uh, that he experienced. And yet, uh, he's talking realistically. And he's writing the best we can say. <coughs> um, most of the New Testament scholars believe he's now in Rome, in prison. Uh, and um, I would be a pretty anxious person if I had a sneaking suspicion that I was facing my martyrdom in the not too distant future, wouldn't you? And this apparently is the last of the epistles we have that he wrote, um, that we have, we don't know, he may have written others, but uh, it is, is one that is noted for joy. Uh, it, it's just filled with uh, uh, very positive thoughts and it's amazing that in those circumstances he could have joy and he <coughs> urges us, in fact he tells us specifically <coughs> to what? Rejoice in the Lord always and if you haven't heard it clearly, I'm going to say it again. What? Rejoice. And then he uses a word, which is a word that is tough to translate. <coughs> the word here is gentleness. In your translation, does it say that in the, it says that in the NIV that I have. <coughs> if you can hear me that, thank <coughs> Gentleness. And um, you can read the top too or I'll spill this knife. And it's, it's really a word that's very difficult to translate. Um, the various translations <coughs> uh, give various words for it. Um, one is the word, uh, let's see here, um, uh, moderation. Let your moderation be known to all persons. Well, that sort of catches it. Another is let your patience be known to all people. Another translation is let your softness be known to all people. Let your honesty be known. Let your forbearance be known. The word that I think probably captures it the best of all is let your magnanimity be known to all people. Uh, magnanimity of life. There's an expansiveness to life uh, that uh, uh, people can see in us uh, the joy of the Lord and also that generosity, that gentleness uh, of spirit, that kindness of spirit uh, that is uh, not the mark of our present political conversation, is it? Um, and, and, and that's where we as followers of Jesus have a wonderful opportunity in this political season to uh, avoid uh, some of the harshness of rhetoric and uh, in our associations to be kind and gentle and magnanimous and understand perhaps where people are coming from that get so angry and say things that cannot be verified and uh, some of the things that are part of our political discussion at this point. Uh, but uh, the uh, magnanimous spirit, William Barclay, in his uh, translation of this, he talks about a, quote, a gracious gentleness. And he talks about a professor, and the professor has a student that gets an 80 on a paper, an examination paper, one that gets a 50. Now, what is that professor technically responsible to do? Flunk the one, right? And give the other one a... Gentlemen, C, would you call it? I don't know. What is an 80 these days? I don't know in grade inflation what has gone on <laughs> in this regard. In my day, a C was not that respectable, but it was okay. And, and, and Barclay says, now, wait a second. This professor uh, basically knows those two students and knows that the one that got the 80 is very bright, came from a very good family educationally, had ideal educational circumstances and background, uh, and basically was sloughing, basically sliding through, didn't do the work, and could have done much better. Whereas a one of the 50 came from a culturally deprived background, a single mother with multiple children, trying to raise him in difficult circumstances, and not a history of education, the first in his family to get into the educational environment, and that professor, no, isn't going to tell the 50 that that's good and keep up the good work. 
that's going to gently encourage that student to use the resources that are there that have never been fully discovered and probably have a fairly firm talk with the one that got the 80 and said, listen, you know, you can do a lot better than that. Why waste your time just sliding through the educational process? That kind of spirit. We see here in this passage a whole approach to anxiety that says joy and magnanimity of spirit really is something that can mark our lives as followers of Jesus Christ, even in very difficult times, even in prison as he is. But then he goes on to say this. Uh, he has the question, how can I rejoice with all my problems, you might say? And uh, how can I have that magnanimity of life toward others when I'm caught up in such anxiety? Because I know uh, with papers due, there's that anxiety. I know with tuition payments to make, there's that anxiety. I know uh, with the challenges that you have in terms of a parent with cancer, uh, a friend who's on drugs, uh, you know the issues you have. It would be very interesting for us to just take a board here and write down all the problems in your individual lives or in the lives of those around you that you love. How can I rejoice? And he gives the antidote to anxiety, and he gives it a twofold one. One, he said, remember what? The Lord is at hand. Stop and think that through. And we prayed about, come Lord Jesus. That's our Advent prayer. Well, the fact is the Lord's right here in the presence of his Holy Spirit. In the life of every follower of Jesus has opened our lives and repented of sin and put our trust in him. And we also know that uh, he could come uh, in the second coming at any time. We're to live with that expectancy, not to set dates, but at least to be aware that at any moment he could come. And the reality is every one of us is just one breath away from our own eternity. I was talking with the president, Ms. Hollinger, about one of our supporters, a man who loves Gordon Conwell, and a man who just a few days ago, in the middle of the night, felt severe pain, and at age 58, is gone. And they're leaving in the morning for his memorial service in Rockford, Illinois. A man who's been very generous with Gordon Conwell. A man who, uh, his wife said, they had no, no history of anything that they knew leading up to this. And here I am at 75. It makes me a little bit worried about whether I'm going to make it through the day. <laughs> well, if I were to worry, but I'm not going to be anxious about it. Uh, I mean, the Lord is at hand. And we're privileged, and any one of us could go at any time. But the fact is the Lord is with us now. The Lord could come at any moment, or any moment we could be in his presence. And not only that, we have the privilege of talking with him. Can you unpack that from the text here? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness, your magnanimity be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by what? Prayer and petition. We can talk to God. He's interested in every detail of our lives. Do you believe that? Do you really? In that term paper? In that test? Now, he doesn't have a magic wand. He wants you to do a little with the gray matter he gave you to get ready and do the work. But he's at hand, and uh, uh, you have the privilege of, of knowing that he's here, and to talk to him, and to treat him as a loving father. I have a daughter who died, I've mentioned to you before, but um, I have another, I have two other daughters, and um, uh, one of them fell and split her chin open, and we had to take her to the emergency room. And I remember the horrified look in her eyes, how big, when the doctor asked me to hold her head steady so he could put the stitches in. And she's trying to catch my eye. I'm holding behind her. But to get her to even let me get my hands on her head, 
she thought I was torturing her, especially when that guy came at her with that big needle to do the stitches. Now, you know, and the doctor knew, and I knew what I was doing. It was out of love, wasn't it? It wasn't out of torture. It was a desire for her to have a face that did not bear forever the huge scar of that terrible fall. But she didn't understand that. And we need to realize that the Lord is with us in the difficult times of life, the most difficult times. As I say, one of my daughters went on to die of cancer. Thought it went through chemotherapy her senior year at Princeton University and then went through her radiation and a year later it came back and on 9-12, 1991, I went to be with the Lord. 9-11 is our national observance. 9-12 is our family observance. But we have the privilege to talk to God and entrust these things to God. And we come then to the central thrust as we conclude. Allow our whole lifestyle to be one of thanksgiving. It says here, rejoice in the Lord always. I will again say it. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, everything, by prayer and supplication, petition, with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Present your request to the Lord. Not only prayer, but to do it in an attitude of thanksgiving. You say, well, well, let me come at it. Three ideas as to how to be thankful. One, thankful for the good things. Make your list of the blessings. When was the last you did that? We have a song that many of you have not heard, you're too young for, but when I'm worried and I can't sleep, I count my blessings instead of sheep, and I fall asleep counting my blessings. And when my bankroll is getting small, I think of when I had none at all, <laughs> and I fall asleep counting my blessings. I think about a nursery, and I picture curly heads, and one by one I count them as they snuggle in their beds. When I'm worried and I can't sleep, I count my blessings instead of sheep, and I fall asleep counting my blessings. I'll assure you, that's one of the best cures for insomnia, is to just thank the Lord and just number them out, and you'll get up to 50, 60, 70, 80 in no time at all if we thank God for the good things. But you say, that's not what I'm worried about. Well, I know, but give God a break. And give yourself a break, because there's a lot of good there. And then the second suggestion is, thank God for the absence of bad things. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, think of all the terrible things that could be going on in your life. <laughs> or think of times when where they were worse than they are now. I remember I used to run. I don't look like it now, but I ran for 40 years and... Uh, Stayed in good shape that way and used to run when I pastored in Key Biscayne, Florida on the beach at low tide. And one day I happened to be running at high tide on the seaweed line and suddenly I felt a suction snap, uh, sort of a puncture. And it was, I, uh, it was on a uh, two by four piece of wood and a rusty nail came right up the, well, I know. Thank God you aren't doing that right now. <laughs> I know. And I'm very grateful I'm not having that experience right now. I still can feel at the bottom of my foot like the tip of an eraser, a little bit of a touch there where that happened, and that happened back in the early 1970s. Uh, I'm very grateful I haven't had that experience today. Uh, remember that time you thought you were sick and were going to die? You can't even remember what year it was now. You can't remember what was wrong with you, right? But re remember, you can remember feeling like you, you just, well... Nothing wrong with thanking the God for absence of bad things. Make a list of the things that could be going wrong in your life. In a way, you don't really have to do that very long to, to get the message, do you? Because 
it's important for us to concentrate on the blessings of good things. But then, yeah, I know what you're saying, but how about the terrible things? The terrible thing, and I can make a list of them. Now, I first preached on this probably one of the first four or five messages I ever gave. And I've returned to this text often through the years because I think it's one of the most important in Scripture. When I first preached about it, I knew people said, well, this young fellow hasn't experienced enough life yet. He doesn't really know the kinds of suffering he can have. Well, I can guarantee you, I've seen it all, and I've experienced most of it. And I can assure you that the Lord is faithful, and God walks with us. And even through the death of a beloved child, and even more recently through the pain of a daughter who husband, uh, she found out, was having multiple affairs behind her back, and the ache and pain of seeing her dreams and all she wanted in life, in terms of family life, go up and smoke as more and more has become revealed to her of what he was doing behind the scenes when she was trusting him. And, uh, and I can say, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. I think I suggested this to you two years ago. I'll conclude with this. I really think one of the best exercises I can suggest, not just in Thanksgiving, the, 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 the thrust here is 365 days a year. Thanksgiving Day. Today, friends, happy Thanksgiving. Why just one day? Just take that piece of paper, which I do, and perhaps I shared this with you two years ago, and put on it positives and negatives. And start listing the negatives in your life. The things for genuinely you're very unhappy. In fact, you might even have an argument with God about them. That's okay. God can handle it. And list them. The negatives. Be very honest about them. And then list the positives. I've never yet had anyone say that this has not worked out this way in their life. I find the negative list is the one I concentrate on first. And I'm very aware of what those negatives are. And after about five or six, I run out of them. And I look and I say, to think how much of my life has been compulsively obsessing over these three, four, five biggies. Because as I begin to put down the positives, that list grows and grows and grows, and I've never yet done it where I could complete on one eight by 11 sheet of paper all the positives, all the things for which to be thankful. Well, you may be a self-made man. You may be a person who uh, uh, needs to... Uh, uh, learn to be grateful and realize things come from others. You may be a Bart Simpson who thinks, well, I did it all myself. What a miserable existence, wouldn't that be? And there are a lot of games we play, and the psychological evidence is there that an attitude of gratitude produces a much more happy lifestyle. But getting beyond the self-help dimensions of this and getting to the core of the biblical message in the pit of a dungeon facing your soon execution, it's possible to thank God and have a spirit of gratitude because you know the Lord is with you. And you can have his joy and his peace in hope. For the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Dear God, thank you for these promises of your word and I would pray, Lord, that in this busy season of writing papers, of anxiety, uh, the challenges of the world around us, ISIS, and what we've seen in Paris, and what we fear could happen here again, uh, we ask, Lord, that uh, you'll help us to be able to say thank you and trust you to help us get through, not somehow, but triumphantly, knowing that you are with us and you know the final end and it's good. 
because of what you've done on the cross for us and the provision you've made for us in your intercession on our behalf before the Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.